It's been a while since we've done all of our power system upgrades, that being our batteries, solar, inverter, all that good stuff that works together, including this cool screen here. So what has worked well and what have we had to fix? Let's get into it. Before we jump into all the details on this, I want to preface this with, I am not an RV solar expert by any means. I've learned a lot about it. I have an extensive history of electronics and electricity and all that good stuff from my days in the military, as well as just from hobbies. Now, this install is my first practical application of all that knowledge. So, you know, I made a few mistakes. I have some things that I would do differently and I'm gonna go over those. We also did find some problems and we're gonna cover those also. We've had a lot of iterations of our power system over the years in this RV. The very first thing we installed were Trojan T105 golf cart six volt batteries, deep cycle batteries, to replace the silly little battery that came with our RV and just give us more power. We then added the GoPower inverter. That was a 2K at first, then we upgraded to a 3K inverter, and that worked pretty well. Since then, we have added more batteries, we've added solar, we've upgraded the inverter. So let's talk about where we are right now. We have 2,000 watts of solar on the roof. That is from 10 solar panels at 200 watts each. Those are separated into two runs in series. Those feed two MPPT Victron smart solar controllers that feed into our DC system, which is 12 volt. Now also on that 12 volt bus are our batteries. We have 10 100 amp hour batteries for 1,000 amp hours total which is 12 kilowatt hours if you want that conversion. We also have the Victron Multi Plus 2, 2X120, that means it powers both sides of our 50 amp RV, which is really cool. It is connected, of course, to our electrical system, but also to this GX Touch 50, which is connected to a Servo GX. Also in the mix is a Victron Smart Shunt. All of this stuff works together to give us this really cool display here and give us real-time information. Additionally, it connects to the internet so we can see our console remotely. We can also log into what's called the Victron Remote Management Portal, or VRM Portal for short, and manage all of our systems, see reports, and get a, a good line on what all of our electronics are doing. We also have an Onan QG5500. That is a quiet gas. 5500 or 5.5 kilowatt generator. It is fed by a 30 gallon tank that is back next to our toy hauler tanks. Uh, we also have a toy tank that holds another 30 gallons and we can use that tank to fill our generator tank, giving us an onboard usable amount of 60 gallons. Now, a lot of you may have noticed that we don't boondock extensively like this system is really designed for. So why do we have all of this gear? Well, two reasons. One, I'm a tech nut and I like to tinker and play and put things together and see how they work. Uh, I've always been interested in solar and so I learned all I could, put the system together. It's working very well, but we'll get to that. Also, we do this for you guys. This is part of our channel. We like to try out gear over the long haul, see how it works in real world life. We never ever ever talk about or recommend any products that we haven't used personally. Before I jump into it, I wanna give just a brief overview of our system and how these pieces work together at a high level. Let's start with the batteries. Our batteries are 12 volt. They can be wired differently, but ours are wired for 12 volt. We have a thousand amp hours, as I mentioned. Now those batteries supply, of course, DC power for things like our lights, our refrigerator, fan motor for the furnace, uh, but it can also be turned into AC power by the inverter for running things like the microwave, the coffee pot, the TVs, computers, all that good stuff. But it also converts AC to DC to charge the batteries, so it's multi-purpose. The inverter can also do a thing called power share, where if we're connected to say 30 amp power at a campground or whatever, it can supplement that power and give us more than 30 amps. So if we wanna run three ACs, we can do that. The inverter will kick in a little bit of extra and combine the two, kind of gives you, lets you do a mix. Now the solar supplies DC power to charge the batteries and kind of run things. That's a little bit of a misnomer. Basically what happens is the solar panels provide DC power to the system. And if there is a deficit in the batteries, it'll charge those. 
If the inverter is inverting, some of that power can go there. If the inverter isn't drawing more power than the solar panels can provide, the extra will go to the battery. So it's all just one big DC system uh, that can have power going to or from the batteries based on what's available. The generator is there for when we are boondocking, don't have any connection to shore power, but need more power than the inverter can supply, or if we need power longer than the inverter can supply in the batteries. So basically it's there as a backup and if we need more than we're getting from solar. For instance, if we want to run three ACs, we can't do that. We can't even run two ACs on our single 3000 watt inverter. So in that instance, we would need to run our generator. And of course, while we're running the generator and running the ACs, it can charge the batteries. So later on at night, when we might only need one AC, we can run that off the inverter. So that's it. How well has it worked? Let me tell you, it's worked really, really well uh, with a few caveats that I'm gonna get to. The Balloon Fiesta, if you haven't seen that video, it's really good, just check it out. That Balloon Fiesta was our first time using the system, fully disconnected, boondocking for 10 days straight. And it was fantastic. We had plenty of juice to run things at night, like our furnace, because it was kind of chilly. Uh, but we also ran our heat pump, which is our, you know, our AC unit. We ran that at night and would only use the furnace when it got below 30. We had plenty of juice during the day. Uh, the most we saw on our solar panels there was about 1400 watts, but we have seen as high as 1800 watts from our 2000 watt solar panels. You're never gonna get that theoretical peak unless it's, you know, you're camping on the equator and it's high noon and the solar panels are perfect and the sky is clear and everything's just fantastic. You might get that 2000 watts. Before I jump into a couple of problems that we have found and fixed, I wanna talk a little bit about what I would do differently having done this once, right? This is my first install. You're always gonna learn lessons at your first practical application of a new technology. So the first thing I would do different on a new install is I would not go with 12 volt. I would go with 24, 36, 48 volts, something higher voltage depending on the type of and number of batteries I was putting in. And that's the other thing I would do differently is I would use larger form factor batteries. You know, we started out with three Battleborns, so I didn't want to get rid of those and go to a new form factor. I just added on to them to make 10. Uh, in hindsight, I probably should have gone the other way and just started over with some of their game changer, the real big guys. Then I would have only needed like three of those versus 10 of the other batteries. And I would have wired them so they were higher voltage, meaning I could use smaller cables and have less heat. I think it's more efficient that way also. So let's get to the issues and things that I found post-install. The first one we found when we got to the Balloon Fiesta. Our Servo GX, that's the little brain. That thing is like the central control module. It talks to the smart shunt, it talks to the solar controllers, it talks to the inverter. It knows all the stuff going on and that's how it gives me this cool display here and shows me visually what's going on with the system. The Servo GX also has built-in Wi-Fi and that's what it uses to connect to whatever internet you have. You do have to have your own internet, but we have a whole setup on that. But it connects over Wi-Fi to our internet system to be able to report to the VRM, to be able to get our remote console, you know, pop up the console on our phone, see what's going on, make sure power's still on, make sure batteries aren't low, that kind of stuff we can do from anywhere in the world. But when we got to the balloon fiesta and people started arriving, all of that Wi-Fi interference, you know, everybody's got just tons of Wi-Fi on their RVs these days. You know, they've got like this system here, our LCI one control has Wi-Fi. Our phones have Wi-Fi. Of course we have our own Wi-Fi. Combine that with a bunch of other people with some of the same mix of stuff and there was too much interference for it to get a good signal to even our local Wi-Fi to connect. There are a couple of ways that I could have addressed this. Uh, one, the simplest one would be to attach a Wi-Fi dongle that might have a little bit more power and be able to reach and communicate with the Wi-Fi. But I knew that was kind of a maybe iffy sort of fix. It may or may not work. What I knew 100% would work is a direct Ethernet cable connection from the Servo GX to our router. But that in itself is troublesome, right? Our Servo GX is down here in the front bay and our router is in the office way in the back. So I pondered it for quite a bit trying to figure out, okay, how am I gonna get an ethernet cable from the front to the back? And then I remembered when I was installing the solar, uh, you know, I had a lot of wiring issues there too, so go watch that video, but the solar comes down on the roof through a junction box, through a path, down into the basement, through our heating duct. If you wanna see why, go see that video, through our heating duct to the front bay. 
but also directly adjacent to that box on the roof is our AC ducting. And when I did our internet install, I used our AC ducting to run an ethernet cable all the way to the bedroom and put an access point up there. So I thought I could use both of these things and combine the two. So that's what I did. I went into the junction box on the roof, I cut a hole into our ducting, and then I fed an ethernet cable all the way back the duct to the office, and then out of the duct through the ceiling over to our tech cabinet. And then I just followed our solar path down into our heating vents and into the front. So now I've got an ethernet cable connecting both ends, hooked it up, and it has been flawless ever since. I mean, it should be, it's a wired connection. It was a bit of a pain, but I'm really glad I did it because now I don't have to worry about any interference or anything like that. Real quick, I'd like to ask you a favor. If you're getting something out of this video and you enjoy it, please show us by clicking that like button. Please subscribe to our channel. Those things really help us out with the whole YouTube algorithm and allows us to keep bringing you free content. The other problem we had was with the generator. Now, unbeknownst to me, our generator doesn't put out just a single line with up to 45 amps. 5,500 watts at 120 volts is about 45.8 amps. So if you wonder why I'm using that number 45 amps, it actually supplies two in-phase connections to each side of our 50 amp panel with a rating of 30 amps each. You know, I never really paid a lot of attention to the wiring on the generator because it always just worked. But when we put in this Victron system, which I'm gonna talk about why in a second here, it made me realize that, oh, wait a minute, this isn't just a 45 amp generator. It's a 45 amp generator that is split into two with a maximum of 30 amps. Now, it doesn't mean it's a total of 60 amps because 30 plus 30, it's just that one line of that can only carry 30 amps. And the Victron, the way it handles in-sync connections, so like if you have a 30 amp connection, uh, a 30 amp dog bone to a 50 amp RV just splits those connections out. So they're going to be in phase. It's the, it's the same physical wire connected to both sides. When the Victron sees that, it says, oh, you're on a single connection. It drops the input from line two and then bridges line one and line two on the output. So what that did is it essentially crippled our input from the generator to our system because the Victron would see is in phase, just like 30 amp. It would disconnect line two, use only line one, but then supply power to the whole RV, line one and line two on the output. It does this on purpose, and it's there so you can actually do power share through the whole RV when you're connected to things like 30 amp. But in this particular situation with this particular generator, it causes a bit of a problem. We found this out the first time that we tried to do power share on the generator during the balloon fiesta. And I set this guy to 45 amps thinking, okay, generator has 45 amps and anything above that, the inverter will handle with power share. And it would just start blowing breakers anytime I tried to run like three ACs. And it was always just one breaker. And then it just dawned on me, duh, you've got two lines out here because there's two lines going to the ATS or automatic transfer switch. So I had an idea for the fix on this and I wasn't 100% sure because I've never done it before. So I posted this on every electricity RV form you could think of. I spoke to every electrical RV brain that I know, like Todd Henson of the NRVTA. I posted it on Mike SoCall's page and got some feedback there. And everybody agreed that my thinking on this was sound. Just like you can wire DC batteries in series or parallel, when you wire a DC battery, say 12 volts in parallel, you get still 12 volts, but you double the amp hours. You also typically double the amount of current it can provide at any given point in time. When you wire something in series, you add the voltage, but you don't increase any kind of amp hours or uh, amp capabilities. Now, AC circuits can be wired in parallel also. You just have to be really, really careful on a couple of things. Number one, those AC sources have to be the exact same voltage. You can't have any difference in voltage, otherwise you're gonna have power going across the two hots and technically have a short there. Also, the sources have to be in phase perfectly, 100% in phase. Otherwise, you have the same situation. You're gonna have a voltage differential between line one and line two, and it's gonna cause problems. Well, my source for these AC synchronized outputs is a single alternator on our generator. Our alternator on the generator has two windings on it, one for line one, one for line two. 
they're on the same little spinny thing. They're not gonna ever, ever, ever get out of phase. But I wanted to verify this. So I got up in the belly of the beast here, fired up the generator and took some measurements at our ATS. So I went into the transfer switch and I first measured the voltage on line one and line two. 119.5.6-ish on there. 119.5 on there. They were an exact match, perfect. I then measured the voltage between line one and line two. And let me go from hot to hot. Bingo, zero on the nose. That's exactly what I'm looking for. And the voltage was zero, perfect. The reason it's a zero is because their sine waves are perfectly in sync and the difference between the two at any given point in time is zero. So now it comes to the actual practical application of wiring these two things in parallel, which is really just taking line one and line two, connecting them together, and then putting them into the ATS. I thought about several ways of doing this, and you know I could have gone complex and had those lines go to a, a separate distribution panel and then come off of there or done something fancy, but really all I needed to do was get those two wires connected together before they go into the ATS. I did a little browsing at Lowe's because sometimes that's where the best ideas come from when you're just walking around looking at stuff saying, oh, I could use that, I could use that. Sometimes you get cool ideas. I came across some grounding bars and they looked beefy enough to handle the current. And I wasn't 100% sure because they didn't have a current rating on them, but I decided to give it a shot. I found one with four connections in it, which was perfect. I could do two in and one out. So that's all I did. I trimmed my line one and line two back a little bit to give me some room in there. I connected both of them to the grounding bar and then I had another six gauge wire. This is all six gauge wiring, by the way, from the grounding bar into the ATS. Now I wasn't 100% sure if the ATS was going to trigger off of just one connection, but it did and it worked great. So I let it connect. We had some nominal loads running here. I checked the voltage on both lines, they were good. I checked the current running to line one and the current running to line two, and they were identical. Boom. This is working as planned. I love it when that happens. Which is exactly how a parallel circuit should run. The downstream loads, whatever they are, let's just say it's 30 amps, should be split evenly between those two sources, 15 and 15. So, so far so good. My next step, was to fire up as much as I could in here. I got all three ACs going. I got the water heater, the fridge, as much stuff as I could get going. I just wanted to get up to that 45 amps. And I let that run for about an hour. My point there was to, again, double check the amperage coming in on line one and line two, make sure they were the same. They were, of course they're higher because I'm drawing more amps. And I also wanted to make sure that that grounding bar didn't get hot at all. Uh, like I said, I didn't really know the amperage rating of that grounding bar, so that was really my way of checking it. If it gets hot, then you know it's providing some resistance and it's not really rated for that current. That all was fantastic. My next step was to run more than 45 amps, set our inverter to 45 amps to make sure that it would pick up the slack. It did, it works great. Now the load is shared across that alternator evenly on both lines. If we happen to go above the 45 amps, the inverter kicks in, picks up the rest. So everything is running great now. We've had several opportunities to test this out uh, where we need to run the generator to charge the batteries and everything is just working really, really well. And if you have any questions, put them below. But that's it. We'll see you next time.